Thanks for joining us for the 208th reading. Catherine Kidwell presented the first Ames reading on Thursday, June 20th, 1985. So I don't know, some of you might have known her. Um, we are here in the Jane Pope Geske Heritage Room of Nebraska Authors. This is a special collection dedicated to promoting and pre preserving works by and about Nebraska authors. It's a representative collection, of course, because we don't have room for everything that we could put in here. Um, there are more than 13,000 volumes, though, on the shelves, and there are more than 3,000 authors from Nebraska with Nebraska Connections represented. We also have information files, magazines, pictures, manuscripts, um, there's artwork. If you look around the room, uh, Lauren Isley's dollhouse is in the room as well, and other memorabilia. So um, look around a little bit, and you'll see some cool things. Um, by the way, the Heritage Room is not tax supported. It's supported by the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association, and we would like to thank the NLHA for the endowment established a number of years ago through their volunteer efforts. And we also thank those who continue to contribute to the Heritage Room Endowment Fund. We invite you to visit the Heritage Room during our regular public service hours, and we are open Tuesday through Friday from 12 to 3, and on Sundays from 2 to 5. And actually, here we are, right in the middle of our Sunday public service hours, having a program today. So that's kind of fun. Um, Ames readings are filmed by Channel 5, Five City TV. And if you're not here in the Heritage Room today, and you're watching this later on Channel 5, I'll just let you know that we're located on the third floor of Bennett Martin Public Library at 14th and N Streets in downtown Lincoln. And we're also pleased that some of the more recent Ames readings are available on Five City TV on their video on demand. Today, we have a talented group and a varied group of people with us. We have Stephanie Whitson and Karen Shoemaker and Helen Johnson, Andrew Jewell and Twyla Hansen. And um, before they come up, I would, would you like to give them a hand? That would be nice. And, <laughs> We'll just <clears throat> we'll welcome them right now. We are presenting today in alphabetical order, but it's a backwards alphabet. And I'll, I'll explain briefly why that is happening today. There is a display behind me that features uh, some Nebraska authors, and they are done backwards alphabetically. Um, that actually stems from my mother teaching me the alphabet backwards when I was little. And I, I hadn't thought about it in a long time, but it came back to me for some reason <laughs> recently. And so we did the display backwards. And I, th I think it's kind of nice to let the Z people stand up first. You're, the A people always get to go first. <laughs> the Z, and Stephanie Whitson gets to go first, and she would normally be last because she's a W. So <laughs> anyway, and I also have uh, a list that I made based on this display, and it is back there on the um, near the dollhouse, and it is a sampling of authors that are done, Nebraska authors that are on here backwards. So it does start with Ed Zimmer, and it ends with Lucy Atkins, who's in the room today too. But but she had to go last because she's an A. But she always goes first. So anyway, so that's what happened. Um, anyway, it seemed like a fun thing to do. So. Um, I will introduce these individually, individuals individually as we go today. Um, as I said, Stephanie Grace Whitson is first today. So uh, a little bit about her. She was born in East St. Louis, Illinois, but she spent many years in Lincoln and Oto County. She received a BA from Southern Illinois University and an MA from Nebraska Wesleyan University. She's been writing full-time since 1995, and some of her interests include pioneer women's history, and quilting. Reflecting those interests, Stephanie has written many books. Her latest is a captain for Laura Rose. Faith Works, March 2014, kind of hot off the press. So, mm -hmm. Stephanie. Thank you. It's really an honor to be here today. And Meredith mentioned Catherine Kidwell, and I didn't realize this was a sort of an anniversary for her, but the only writing 
class I've ever taken was through Southeast Community College, and Catherine Kidwell was my instructor. <laughs> and her book had just come out, um, the one that was Book of the Month Club with Devil Day. It was quite, quite a big hit. And uh, so thank you, Mrs. Kidwell. <laughs> Here I am, one of your kids. Um, 1994 was the year when I signed my very first book contract, and that book came out in 95. So 2014, I'm celebrating my 20th anniversary as a published author. I've written for Thomas Nelson in Nashville, um, Bethany House in Minneapolis, Barber Publishing in Uricksville, Ohio, the Kansas City Star Quilt Books in down in Kansas City, for Nav Press in Colorado, and now I'm with Faith Words, who are also in Nashville. So I guess I've gone full circle with publishers. But over those years, I've worked with probably 10 different editors, and it's been wonderful to learn from them. Um, I've been very blessed to have very wonderful editors who believe in my ability to tell a story, but who also are never shy about ways that I need to make it better. <laughs> so I appreciate that very much. Um, historical fiction for some people is a bothersome genre because they're worried about what we storytellers are going to do with their history. <laughs> and I kind of am a schizophrenic person and I appreciate that creative dissonance because I have always come to fiction through history. The real history is the most important thing to me and real women's history, women of the Great Plains, is usually what ends up inspiring one of my stories. So the only way I know to explain how I do um, justice to both of those things is that I take imaginary people and I put them into historical situations that are as historically accurate as I can make them. I try to do um, a lot of research. I love the history first and often I'm a little disappointed that I actually have to write a book about this thing that I've studied because I'd rather go and study something else. But since um, I do have to write the story because that's how I make my living, I, I make my do that. One of my favorite storytellers is Bess Streeter Aldrich. I met Bess Streeter Aldrich not in person, but because I was working at a, a chili supper at a church. And a gentle, elderly woman and I were talking, and she said, do you like to read? And we were chit-chatting about what we like to read. And she said, you should read my neighbor's books. And I said, well, who's your neighbor? And she said, Bess Streeter Aldrich. And that was the first time I'd ever heard that name. But I love Bess Streeter Aldrich's storytelling abilities, and I love to go back and reread her books. And I think I'm probably in the line of storytellers like her. Um, my books have a very strong element of Christian faith in them. They always have a happy ending, so they're not literary fiction, which I could not write anyway because I don't have the brain or the attention span for that kind of language, even though I enjoy reading it. Um, someone asked Best Streeter Aldrich one time to compare herself with Willa Cather, and she said, Willa Cather writes literature. I'm a storyteller. And I like that difference, and I also appreciate very much that in Nebraska, readers give those of us with these different bents room to grow and a chance to express ourselves through story or through poetry or through other literary endeavors. So I'm, I'm very honored to be here today. I think it was Virginia Woolf who said that for most of history, Anonymous was a woman. <laughs> and um, I learned and have met many wonderful anonymous women in my tales and in my study. I came to fiction writing not until I was in my 40s. I never thought I would ever be a novelist, but my children were learning Nebraska history. And I began to read the diaries and reminiscences of Nebraska's pioneer women, and that's what inspired my very first book. And I'm still digging through files and folders at the Nebraska State Historical Society, and I'm finding more stories than I have life left to tell. But the book that I'm going to read to you from today is more about river, st uh, river history. The Missouri River borders our state, and I started to learn a little bit about river history and steamboat history. And so while I was researching another steamboat book, which came out a couple years ago, I met, quote unquote, you know, I, I say I meet these people, but you do know they're dead, right? So, <laughs> um, but I met this woman, her name was Minnie Hill, and she was the first woman who was a licensed steamboat pilot west of the Mississippi. 
Now, when you think about steamboats and you think about rivers and you think about levees and you think about dock workers, you would get a certain picture in your mind of what this woman who piloted a steamboat probably looked like. Minnie Hill was about this tall. She was about that big around. And the only picture I've ever seen of her, she was wearing a gorgeous, elegant Victorian beaded gown. Not the picture I had in mind. And I wanted to write a story about a woman steamboat pilot on the Missouri River, not on the river that many piloted on. I'm glad I chose the Missouri because Mark Twain wrote about the Mississippi. And reading Mark Twain's book about piloting a steamboat in the middle of working on the book that I'm writing, I really had a crisis, whatever made me ever think I could write a steamboat book. But at least it's a different river. And the Missouri River was a very different river from the Mississippi. And um, this is what one of the Missouri River pilots said about the experience in 1866. It takes a real man to be a Missouri River pilot, and that's why a good one draws down as high as $1,000 a month. If a Mississippi boat makes a good trip to New Orleans and back, its milk-fed crew think they've turned a trick. Bah, that's creek navigating. But from St. Louis to Fort Benton and back, close on to 5,000 miles, son, with cottonwood snags waiting to rip a hole in your bottom, and the fastest current there ever was on any river daring your engines at every bend, and with engines hiding in the bushes at the woodyard landings, that's a hair on your chest he-man trip for you. <laughs> So it was fun to put a woman in that situation and to see how she did. Because I love Nebraska, I'm going to read the part about navigating the Missouri that mentions some towns in Nebraska that you'll recognize. The familiar sound of a steam engine straining to power a paddle wheel woke Laura in the middle of the night. Or it woke Log Jam, who woke Laura. Log Jam's the dog. Either way, when she opened her cabin door to investigate, the first thing she noticed was that the wind had died down. Dressing quickly, Laura stepped outside and looked upriver toward where the Colonel Kid had been tied up at sundown. Jack McCoy had sent part of his crew upriver in a skiff, and they'd sounded the depths and set floating lights out to mark the channel for safe passage. Hurrying down to the freight deck, Laura roused the crew, leaving McKnight to sleep or wake as he wished. McKnight is her co-pilot. Following in the wake of the Colonel Kidd, the Laura Rose slipped between the lights set out by McCoy's crew and then at Brownville headed for the levee while the other packet continued on out of sight. They put off the lone passenger who wanted to disembark at Brownville, and by the time that was accomplished, the lights upriver had flickered out. Laura ordered the crew to tie up until dawn could light the way. In the half-light of the hour just past dawn, they eased past the wreck of the Nora, a packet slowly being torn apart by the river as she rested on the bottom, only her wheelhouse visible above the waterline. The fresh reminder of just how quickly disaster could strike made Laura shudder. She was just coming into Nebraska City, where they'd be putting off freight, when McKnight hoisted himself into the wheelhouse. You've already passed the Nora. Nothing to it, Laura said. I heard there was a quartz mill on board that packet, a $30,000 piece of mining machinery at the bottom of this river. He looked over at her, heard she was running at night, too, when a Sawyer ripped her hull wide open. Was she running lights? Don't know. And there's a little bit of a spark there, because he's trying to tell her that maybe she shouldn't have been running at night. And she's telling him that she knows what she's doing. Um, Finn McKnight. It, the book is set in 1867, and so that means that all of the men who were in the book would have experienced in some measure the Civil War. And so I had to think about that. What would their service during the Civil War have been like and what would have done to them? And the character Finn McKnight has what we modern day psychology people call um, survivor's guilt. He didn't get hurt in the war at all. And he has a problem with that and he tries to get rid of that problem with alcohol. And so he has a real struggle. Late Saturday, a discouraged Finn McKnight stood with his back to the river, staring toward the familiar doorway, spilling light and music and raucous laughter into the dark night. It had been months since he'd gone through one of those doors. How long would it be before the allure finally, once and for all, lost its hold over him? Would he ever be free of temptation? 
He moistened his lips, imagining the first jolt, and then the next on the second, and then maybe a third shot burned its way into his gut, seared his thoughts, and eventually numbed everything, making life easier. Except that it didn't, not really. Whiskey might make the demons that called him a worthless failure recede for a time, but they always came back. Eventually, it took more than a shot, more than three, more than half a night of steady drinking to silence them, and then dreams launched him back to hospital duty during the war, and that gave different demons free reign to resurrect the images of severed limbs piled near the hearth of an upstairs bedroom in a plantation house they'd used for a hospital after the Battle of Franklin. Even tonight, standing here on the St. Louis levee, that memory made him shudder. He'd nearly killed himself trying to drink it and others away. Guilt was mixed in there somewhere, too. The guilt of returning whole when most of his friends either died or lost something. He hadn't lost anything but himself. And I'm going to end with a little bit of a fun reading. Log Jam is a dog that the family rescued off of a floating pile of debris in the river. And Log Jam is very fearsome looking. I thought of him as a cross between a boxer and a pit bull. Um, but he's decided that he owns the boat. And so he takes ownership and he defends it. And he is, um, comes in very handy in a few scenes in the book. But this one is more of a fun one. What you need is a good rest, Elijah said, and he's speaking to the captain, Laura. I'll make you a toddy, and Log Jam here will stand guard while you sleep. Things will look better tomorrow morning. They always do. You head on up. I'll bring that toddy directly. When she donned her wrapper, Laura propped her cabin door open with Mama's satchel, then climbed up on her bed and pulled Mama's afghan around her shoulders. Log Jam came to the edge of the bed and rested his chin there, looking up at her mournfully. When she leaned down to pat his head, he licked the back of her hand, just once, but it was enough to startle her and make her laugh. You did good, you know. She scratched behind one of the dog's ears. He strained against her hand, then put one white paw on the edge of her bed. Are you trying to beg your way up here now? He's already begged his way into the cabin because the rule has always been no dogs allowed in the cabins. And if you have a dog, you've had this happen to you. With a soft whine, the dog removed the paw and rested his chin back on the comforter. He moved only his eyes, back and forth, from comforter to her face and back again. <laughs> I'm going to regret this, Laura said as she patted the space beside her. Who would have thought a big dog could move that fast? <laughs> Elijah arrived, cup and saucer in hand. He spoke to the dog first. Well, look at you. A reward for his part in the recent rescue, Laura said. You do realize you've a permanent fixture unless you lock him out. I imagine so, Laura tucked her feet beneath Log Jam's warm body. I don't mind. You'll mind when you wake up in the morning and his head is on your pillow. <laughs> So a little bit of levity at the end. Um, very serious book about a lot of threats to lives because it was a very difficult life, and yet Log Jam enabled me to put a little star of sunshine in there, too. So thank you very much. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, and proceeding now backwards a little bit earlier in the alphabet, we have Karen Gettert Shoemaker. She was born and raised in O'Neill, Nebraska, lived in Omaha briefly, and has been in Lincoln since 1977. She has three UNL degrees, including a PhD in creative writing. And her work, primarily fiction, appears in a number of publications. Her most recent book is a novel, The Meaning of Names, Red Hen Press, March 2014. So a couple of people with books hot off the press, so we can say, Karen. <clears throat> I feel like I should walk backwards up here, but <laughs> thank you all for coming on this sunshiny day. It's so nice to see spring. I like following Stephanie because she gave such a great description of historic fiction, histor historical fiction. So, and that's what I write also. So, um, I don't have to cover that. And I don't think I could do it as well. I admire her for a lot of reasons. One of which she writes more than one book every 15 years, the way some of us do. <laughs> <laughs> and they're good books. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to be reading from *The Meaning of Names*. This book takes is set in 1918 in a small town in north central Nebraska. It's um, actually based on um, 
true stories, but I took liberty with those stories. I, um, the main character, the prototype for the main character is my grandmother, and um, I changed her name because I couldn't um, get her to behave as anyone but my grandmother on the page, so I changed her name a little bit. But I, uh, um, many of the things that happened did happen to her. They came from family stories, but there was a lot of research about the time that um, expanded the, the uh, scope of the book to include the German-American experience during that t the World War I. And um, this the scene that I'm going to read, I have no idea whether my grandmother even was aware of the situation, but I put her as witness so that I could share this because it's, it's um, the inciting incident of the novel, which is how much animosity there was toward the German-Americans during World War I. So this is um, a bit of an intense scene. It comes early on. It is Gerda, the main character, and her children are going back to her hometown of West Point from Stewart, Nebraska and they're taking a train ride. So I'm just going to let the fiction speak for itself it's, and go from there. Outside the window, the plains sprawled, devoid of color and contrast. Morning looked like noon, and the whole day could have been evening. The horizon, that line where sky touches earth, disappeared, and there was no distinction between near and far. Shapes were merely large or small if they appeared at all outside the frosty train windows. Mostly there was only whiteness. As is the case on such days, the world shrank to what was immediate to each soul. When earth and sky are one, the only reference point is the self. Most of the train's occupants fell into a kind of trance of silence between each station stop. The January wind blew across the treeless plains, grabbing gusts of icy snow that t rattled the windows, and the train car itself shivered against it at times. To keep warm, people huddled beneath coats, blankets, and buffalo robes. The hypnotic motion of the train soothed the rush of Gerda's heart that had been set pounding the day before when she first read The Wire. Feeling sure of herself, she kept the children busy with finger games and puzzles until the rhythmic motion of the train lulled them to sleep, and for a long while she simply watched the world go by. Across the aisle from her sat the only other woman who had gotten on at the Stewart station. In the flurry of departure, Gerda had paid her little attention, and now the woman had dozed off, as had most of the other passengers. In the silence, Gerda studied the cut of her dress and saw that it was rich and looked sewn by a tailor, not a farm wife. She noticed things like that, the way the cuffs were tightly machine stitched, not merely hand basted and pressed. She checked the pleating on her own sleeve in comparison. The traveling bag the woman carried was a deep burgundy tapestry with leather handles and brass fittings. At first glance, Gerda didn't notice the wear on the edge of the bag, the tear in the seam that had been poorly mended. But once she did, she saw, too, the ragged hem of the tailored dress, the shine at the elbows of her coat. She studied the woman a little closer. She looked tired to the bone. Even with her face slack in sleep, she looked as though all she wanted was to rest. When the blanket she had wrapped around her legs slipped to the floor, she didn't stir. Gerda reached across the aisle and pulled it up, tucked it between the woman's behind and the seat. Only those closest to the heat stove at the front of the car seemed capable of movement or conversation. From her position in the middle of the train, Gerda watched the three men on benches at the front. They had also boarded in Stuart that morning, rushing ahead of the two women, more like unruly boys than grown men. It was an impression they still generated as they alternated between boisterous shouts and shushing one another. Their attention on a game of some sort, dice or cards, she couldn't see what they had between them. Despite their boyishness, they had the look of working men. They shared the ruddy complexion born of working in the extremes of cold and heat, typical to the plains. The homespun, everyday nature of their clothes brought to mind the clothes she first made and then often mended for Fritz. Fritz seemed constantly to outgrow his clothes so that they were always and ever a touch too small. He was a big man, her husband, six foot three and as broad at the hips as he was at the shoulders. Like the men at the front of the train, he had a roughness of movement when indoors, as if he were uncomfortable with anything but sky above him. 
These men were farmers, maybe, or railroad workers, men used to hard physical labor. They looked like most of the men from home, familiar as a neighbor she had seen but not met. Perhaps she passed them on the street or at the mercantile in town. The rumble of the tra train on the track and the rattle of the railroad car covered the sound of the men's conversation, and to Gerda they were sim something simply a place to rest her eyes. Though they were good at hiding it, she saw they passed a bottle back and forth. She lowered her eyes when they looked up to see who was watching. The man in the black Hamburg got on somewhere near Pilger. He took off the hat as he walked down the row, an action that seemed both natural and refined. But once he took his seat near the heat stove at the front of the car, he put it back on, too cold for such politeness. A dark-eyed, broad-shouldered man, he reminded Gerda of one of her uncles, though she couldn't say for certain which one. Her father's brothers, Joseph and Ambrose, had that same look of having made money in America, the look that showed in the way they held their heads, upright and aware of their own spine. It was just outside Wisner that something started to change. She had been looking out the window and had seen the depot come into view as the train made the long sweep toward the south. First, the red shingled building was small, then it grew larger, and then she couldn't see it any longer, and only white land and sky were left to be seen outside the window. How small humans are in this big world, and how far away from everything they seem to be out here on the plains. Gerda shivered at the thought, and when she looked back at the men in the front, she noticed the three younger men had moved closer to one another. Their shoulders were hunched and their heads tipped close together. The man in the black coat sat the man in the black coat sat and settled back into his own seat with his hat pulled forward but something about the scene made her think he had just stopped moving not knowing quite why she reached out and tucked the blanket more firmly around the children leo drowsily crawled out from his place between his brothers and into her lap before falling back to sleep out of the corner of her eye, she saw one of the young men stand up and begin gesturing at the man in the black coat, and then the other two stood up and started shouting at him, too. Something told her to not look directly at the scene as it unfolded. She couldn't understand most of their words, slurred and angry-sounding as they were, and the ones she did, she didn't want to hear. Curse words she had heard only once or twice in her entire life filled the air. The faces of the young men were contorted and flushed. The older man sat with his palms up and outward, trying to placate them, it seemed. In the seats around the group, people began to wake up, sit up, though no one moved to join in. What happened next happened so quickly there was no time to speak out or reach up to the brake cord and stop the train. There really was no time. Gerdes was certain of this. It all happened so quickly. It would take longer to say it than to live it. One minute the young men were shouting, and the next they were hitting and dragging the other man down the aisle toward the door. His black wool coat, already pulled off one shoulder, caught on the edge of Gerdes' seat as they dragged him past. One of the men jerked, not the coat free, but the man's arm, and she heard a grinding snap. He cried out, a scream like a throat-cut sow. Another of the men grabbed his head and smashed it against the seat back. Blood splattered, droplets of it hitting the blanket under which her children slept. Gerda's hand reached out. She told herself it was to stop them or to help him. But what she did was draw the blanket back, pulling her children closer to her. She protected what she could. They threw him from the moving train as easily as, as easily as they would a bundle of rags, and that's exactly what he looked like as he rolled down the incline beside the tracks and disappeared into the whiteness beyond. Gerda looked, turned so quickly toward the window she nearly dropped baby Leo. No, she cried, and reached to grab Leo with one hand, while with the other she reached for the stranger outside the window. Everyone in the car was awake then some looking around in shock, others looking scared and confused. The woman across the aisle, her sharp nose red with fright, looked at Gerda as if to rush toward her. The three men came back inside, the metal door clanging behind them. They walked unsteadily, unsteadily now that their mission was accomplished. And that's what we'll do to any of you damned Germans if you think you can get away with criticizing this great country, one of them shouted.
poof, like a bubble, bursting. There were smiles then and laughter. All around the car, people began clapping, began shaking hands with the young men, who were suddenly taller and stronger than anyone else in the car. One of them said, I don't need to wait for the uniform before I start protecting this country from Germans. We'll take care of those dirty Kaiser lovers, someone called. And another voice answered, Krauts don't belong here. The bottle the three men had secretly shared was passed around from one willing hand to another. Ger Gerda felt a shrill of cold climb up from her hands and feet. As the blood left her extremities, she felt paralyzed by fear. Across from her, the lone woman shrank back against her seat, pulling her coat up around her neck and sinking into it until only her eyes showed. She kept her gaze on the floor. There were tears. Awakened now to this excitement, her boys let their blankets fall to the floor. Ray and Frank, their faces so round, so German, peered at her and the mayhem around them. Why are they laughing, Mama? Frank asked, and she shushed him. She pulled the children toward her into her lap and whispered into Frank's blonde and wispy hair, Shh, shh, just be still. Ray pulled away from her, the better to see the activity around them. They were too young to know what's happening, she thought. Too young. She didn't want to explain any of it. She didn't want to let the world do what the world would most surely do to their hearts. They were miles from home now, and the war, the one she had so confidently said was too far away to have any effect on them, had suddenly found Gerda Drieke Vogel and her three small boys. Thank you very much. Karen, thank you. Um, next, we have Helen Waring Johnson. Helen lives in Geneva, and she has a degree in UNL, from UNL in English. During her studies, she discovered Weldon Keys, especially taking an interest in his poetry and his music. In conjunction with the 100th anniversary of Keys' birth, which was February 24th, um, 1914, Helen will briefly discuss and sing several of his musical works. Um, as a side note, and I'll probably mention this again later, there is currently a little display of Keys sheet mu music at Love Library that you might want to check on too. So, Helen. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I appreciate being here amongst people who have spent a lot of time by themselves writing and reading. Oops, lots of, whoa, <laughs> lots of information. All right. <clears throat> Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge Virginia Keeler Knoll, uh, a fellow native, Geneva native, and for many years, an important contributor to Lincoln's art and literary scene. I'm gonna, let's give Virginia a hand. Yes, thank you for being here, Virginia. Uh, Virginia's late husband, Dr. Robert E. Knoll, collected and edited the letters of Weldon Keyes, found in Weldon Keyes, The Mid-Century Generation, Letters 1935 to 1955, published by the University of Nebraska Press in 1986. And here is the book. Um, on February 24, 1914, John and Sarah Keyes of Beatrice, Nebraska, welcomed the birth of their son, Harry Weldon, who became one of the mid-century's most versatile and unique artistic personalities. Beginning with early success as a published short story writer and poet, Keyes explored abstract ex expressionist art film and photography, as well as composing and playing ragtime piano music. One of the most neglected facets of Keyes' creative life are his song lyrics, most of which were written in collaboration with clarinetist Bob Helm after Keyes had moved to San Francisco in 1950. I'm going to sing three of these songs that I've arranged this afternoon. James Rydell, 
in his biography of Key's Vanished Act, describes the role of music in Key's childhood. Quote, by watching his parents, he even learned how to operate a Victrola before he was three years old and could find his favorite records. When his mother asked him how he did this, he pointed to the words on the label. Recognizing his giftedness, for she was a teacher, Sarah taught him to read well before he entered the first grade. Sarah also taught him to play the upright piano. Later, Key's piano playing became a fixture at social events. Quote, Key's too could be the center of attention, often at Inyado's music room. There he had a Steinway concert grand to himself and banged out Fats Waller for his new friends, along with his own renditions of What Is This Thing Called Love and St. Louis Blues. The first song, I, I'm Like Poison to Men, tells of a young woman's unsuccessful attempts by using popular products of the day and other means to become attractive to men. And I need to get my music. I'm like poison to men. I'm the girl who turns up every Sunday on the comic page. And someone is whispering, poor Mary Jean, why doesn't she find out about Listerine, or a dream, or clean it, or energy? And with a vengeance, I've taken their advice, but so far, it's been no done. made myself lovely both inside and out with mum and lavoris and something called scout i'm fresh with life boy i never eat kraut still i'm like poison to men the telephone boys taught me ever so much in leading my accent in french the right touch and i can say yes in swahili or dutch still i'm like poison to men popularity i've beaten in vain at your door just one long low whistle would be so beneficial who could ask for anything more the telephone much in leading my accent in French the right touch and I can say yes in Swahili or Dutch still I'm like poison to men <laughs> <laughs> oh thank you Weldon Keys yeah Daybreak Blues was one of several songs written for Keyes' friend, Ketty Frierson Lester. Rydell writes of a performance of this song shortly after Keyes' disappearance on July 18, 1955. Quote, one week after Key's disappearance, Michael Grieg, Weldon's friend and business partner, opened his radio show Behind the Scenes that Weldon had co-hosted with him, with Ketty Frierson Lester singing Daybreak Blues, which Grieg had discovered the day before in Keyes' apartment. The Torch song had taken on a new meaning as Ketty sang, Got the Bad News. Now it no longer simply lamented being abandoned by a lover. It's giveaway lines in which Phyllis Diller and other friends now thought that they heard Keyes predict his own death had become more haunting. Daybreak Blues. A singer's must. <laughs> Oops. Right. 
daybreak, listening to your footsteps go by. There'll be no sun in the sky, took your suit and shoes. I got these daybreak blues, got the bad news, I got those blues at daybreak, staring at the sidewalk below. Down where a lot of folks go, for that's one way to lose these awful daybreak blues. Sunshine, I ain't gonna see ya no more, cause my man's done and left me this morning. Around a quarter past four Sunshine Go get lost back of some dark cloud For I'm not in no mood for any living Pull the shades and moan out loud Sitting at my window waiting night to turn day this is one I'd rather miss. So alone, never known. There could be blues that make you feel like this. Woke up in the night, my man was packing his things. Didn't even say goodbye. And now my heart's like lead. Feel half dead, waiting and watching the sun turn red. I've got those blues at daybreak, listening to your footsteps go. There'll be no sun in the sky, took your suit and shoes. I've got these daybreak blues, got the bad news, I've got those blues. Break, staring at the sidewalk below Down where a lot of folks go For that's one way to lose These awful daybreak blues Thank you, thank you. Ah. Before I sing the final song, I'd like to express my appreciation for being a part of this reading series. I would also like to mention that a recording of around two dozen key songs is in the planning stage. It is my hope that this educational CD will help further our appreciation for this all too neglected Nebraska author. The final song of my presentation, Pick Up the Pieces, which is arranged in a Latin style, was one of Keyes and Helms' favorite favorites. Rydell writes, the song that Helm and Keyes felt would be their best, indeed, the one that might sell, came after they had been working together for nearly three years, three months, three months. Pick Up the Pieces had the right balance of tastefulness, wit, and the bittersweet. It also had a little of the color of Key's poetry under its smart surface, a kind of brittle chill playing as it would on the notion of the fragmented being of existentialism of clinical psychology. It was something Robinson would have played at Tempo de Schizzi, and as annotated in Key's hand on the music's manuscript. Pick up the pieces. Couldn't be more divided or a slant. So disconnected and strange, wanting to change but can't. Feel like I've fallen. Fifty stories down, and it's no joke when you've been 
so badly broken, broken. Pick up the pieces, that's all that's left of me now. I'm like a cocktail glass that's shattered in your hand. Pick up the pieces, pieces that once were my heart. You'll never care if it mends or if it ends or breaks apart. You picked me up, I loved it. Months ago, whatever happened, I don't know. So pick up the pieces, throw them away, say amen. Because, like Humpty Dumpty, I can't be put together again. Thank you, thank you. And happy 100th birthday year, Weldon Keys. Thank you very much. I'm going to trip you up. <laughs> thank you, Marina. Okay. Well, thank you, Helen. Now I'm kind of wondering if we can talk Andy Jewell into singing one of Cather's uh, I'm sure you don't love Cather's letters. <laughs> okay, next up we do have Andrew Jewell, born in North Platte, Nebraska. He's lived in Lincoln since the year 2000. Has three degrees from Hastings College, the University of Missouri, Columbia, and UNL. He's an associate professor of digital projects at the UNL Libraries. I'm not sure that's the exact title. Uh, close enough. <laughs> and the editor of the Willa Cather Archive. He's published several essays on Willa Cather and other American writers on scholarly editing and digital humanities. And he has published with Janice P. Stott the Selected Letters of Willa Cather, published last year in 2013 by Alfred A. Knopf. Andy. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here today. That will be a tough act to follow. Uh, um, it, is, it has been a great pleasure of mine over this last year to talk about Willa Cather's letters and share some of them. Um, and I'll briefly just say that uh, though Cather w was a very highly regarded author when she died in 1947, she did not have her letters published right away after her death as is typical for many authors of her stature because she said in her will that she did not want them published. And that directive was followed for over 60 years by her first two executors. But now but she, did, she did leave the option for the future to make its own decisions, as one commentator said. And now the um, her executor are two educational organizations. It's the University of Nebraska Foundation and the Willa Cather Foundation. And together these groups know that the time is right to to make these letters visible and, and public for the first time ever. And uh, it is a real honor for me to be able to have worked with Janice Stout on producing this book and to share them with you. What, I, what I'd like to read to you today is um, first, a, a little bit from our introduction, actually. I haven't done this before, but I thought I would share with you some of our own thoughts about what makes these letters important and valuable and um, meaningful as documents to read. And then I want to share part of a really important letter Cather wrote to one of her mentors, Sarah Orne Jewett, who is another author that was very well known in the 19th century and who taught Cather a lot. Um, this is from the, first from the introduction. The attitudes, emotions, and voice of Cather's letters are as diverse as one would expect from any human being over the course of 60 years. Yet in another way, there is a consistency of personality throughout all of them, a tang of Cather's character that one can sense in all of her prose. It's difficult and perhaps fruitless to try to define this quality, but one might call it frankness or self-possession. Cather is always vitally herself, even when she confesses anxious self-consciousness and in spite of her habit of writing falsehoods about trivial matters. 
Her voice in her letters, as in her fiction, emerges from an, an emotional and intellectual commitment to what it is she has to say. Her writing is not pretentious and does not seem, as Cather said about the work of another writer, as if she were packing a trunk for someone else and trying conscientiously to put everything in. Mm -hmm. Instead, when reading Cather's letters, one can feel the force of a vibrant individual personality deeply interested in things. Cather herself identified this ability to be interested as the source of her strength as a writer. In, 19, in a 1938 letter to her brother Roscoe, she wrote, As for me, I have cared too much about people and places, cared too hard, but it made me as a writer. And what she called in the same letter the heat under the simple words is present throughout her correspondence. From the funny reports of Red Cloud Nebraska life she wrote when she was a teenager in the 1880s to the painful letters of the 1940s when she despaired at her, home, at her own worn down body and the heartbreaking destruction of a world at war. The voice of Cather's correspondence is in many ways strikingly consistent with the voice of her fiction. It is confident, elegant, detailed, open-hearted, and concerned with profound ideas without relying on heavy philosophical language. But in other ways, the style of her voice in the correspondence is significantly different than the polished voice of her fiction. One senses that the letters are Cather's voice without the refinement of the revision process. The letters sometimes reveal Cather as a rather histrionic character. Her correspondents get regular tirades about poor health, challenges of work and housekeeping, and exhaustion. She can be, in modern parlance, a drama queen. <laughs> the results, this results in claims that are not measured or deliberate, but instead make for dr a dramatic rhetorical effect. For example, in a 1916 letter to her brother Douglas, she discusses some conflict she had with him and the rest of her family and huffs, I think I've had my belting and it's taken the fizz out of me all right. And I'll tell you this, it's positively shipwreck for work. I doubt whether I'll ever write anything worthwhile again. To write well, you have to be all wrapped up in your game and think it awfully worthwhile. I only hope I'm not so spiritless, I won't be able to make a living. <laughs> but Cather's hyperbole, though it can be misleading, uh, another letter is written on the same day to a different brother, and she says in that one she has an exciting idea for a new novel. Uh, <laughs> this, this, this hyperbole is not exactly dishonest. Rather, it is consistent with her straightforward emotional experience of the world. I'm sure you realize, she wrote to her friend Carrie Minor Sherwood in 1945, that things have always hit me very hard. I suppose that is why I never run out of material to write about. The inside of me is so full of dents and scars, where pleasant and unpleasant things have hit me in the past. Faces, situations, things people said long ago simply come up from my mind as if they were written down there. They would not be there if they hadn't hit me hard. She felt things keenly. And her letters are one of the chief records she left of that feeling. In some respects, that is what makes Cather's letters such a pleasure to read. She is wrapped up in whatever emotion she wished to communicate. When she is angry, she lets fly with specific, strongly worded scoldings that almost make one wince. When she is ill, one practically feels the pain and lethargy with her. And when she is excited, when she is consumed with the pleasure of creative work, or when she wants to let someone know that she cares deeply for them, the glow of that emotion is felt, even across all these years. That is, in the end, why Cather's letters should be published. She was a great writer, and these words of her deserve readers. Now I want to skip to a letter. Um, and let me first set it up a little bit. Uh, Cather uh, had met Sarah Orne Jewett um, in 1906 or so, when she was started working for McClure's Magazine. She was on assignment in Boston. Um, and Jewett was one of the first very successful women writers that she, she met, and she really encouraged Cather in her work. Um, in, on December 13th, 1908, Jewett wrote a letter to Cather that's a remarkable one, where she gave Cather some important advice about her writing. And here's a, a bit of Jewett's advice to Cather. She said, your vivid, exciting companionship in the office, which at McClure's magazine where Cather worked, must not be your audience. You must find your own quiet center of life and write from that to the world that holds offices and all society, all Bohemia, the city, the country. In short, you must write to the human heart, the great consciousness that all humanity goes to make up. Otherwise, what might be strength in a writer is only crudeness, and what might be insight is only observation. Sentiment falls to sentimentality. You can write about life, 
but not write life itself. And to write and work on this level, we must live on it. We must at least recognize it and defer to it at every step. We must be ourselves, but we must be our best selves. And here is Cather's response to that letter from Jewett. This is from December 19th, 1908. My dear, dear Miss Jewett, such a kind and earnest and friendly letter you sent me, I have read it over many times. I have been in deep perplexity these last few years, and troubles that concern only one's habits of mind are such personal things that they're hard to talk about. You see, I was not made to have to do with affairs, what Mr. McClure calls men and measures. If I get on at all in that kind of work, it's by going at it with the sort of energy most people have to exert only on rare occasions. Consequently, I live just about as much during the day as a trapeze performer does when he is on the bars. It's catch the right bar at the right minute or into the net you go. <laughs> I feel all the time so dispossessed and bereft of myself. My mind is off doing trapeze work all day long and only comes back to me when it is dog tired and wants to creep into my body and sleep. I really do stand and look at it sometimes and threaten not to take it in at all. I get to hating it for, so for not being any more good to me. Then reading so much poorly written matter as I have to read has a kind of deadening effect on me somehow. I know that many great and wise people have been able to do that, but I am neither large enough nor wise enough to do it without getting a certain kind of dread of everything that is made out of words. I feel deluded and weakened by it all the time, relaxed as if I had lived in a tepid bath until I shrunk from either heat or cold. But Mr. McClure tells me he does not think that I will ever be able to do much at writing stories, that I am a good executive and I'd better let it go at that. <laughs> I sometimes, indeed, I very often think he's right. If I have been going forward at all in the last five years, it has been progress of the head and not of the hand. At 34, one ought to have some sureness in their pinpoint, some facility in turning out a story. In other matters, things about the office, I can usually do what I set out to do and can learn by experience. But when it comes to writing, I'm a newborn baby every time, always coming to it naked and shivery and without any bones. I never learn anything about it at all. I, I sometimes wonder whether one can possibly be meant to do the thing in which they are more blind and inept at than anything else in the world. But the question of work aside, one has a right to live and reflect a little. When I was teaching, I did. I learned more or less all the time. But now I have the feeling of standing still, except for a certain kind of facility and getting the sort of material Mr. McClure wants. It's stiff mental exercise, but it's about as much food to live by as elaborate mental arithmetic would be. Of course, there are interesting people and interesting things in the day's work. But it's all like going around the world in a railway train and never getting off to see anything any closer. I don't have a reporter's mind. I can't get things and fleeting glimpses, and I can't get any pleasure out of them. And the excitement of it doesn't stimulate me. It only wears me out. Now, the kind of life that makes one feel empty and shallow and superficial, that makes one dread to read and dread to think, can't be good for one, can it? It can't be the kind of life one was meant to live. I do think that kind of excitement does to my brain exactly what I have seen alcohol do to men's. It seems to spread one's very brain cells apart so they don't touch. Everything leaks out as the power does in a broken circuit. So whether or not the chief is right about my never doing much writing, I think one's immortal soul is to be considered a little. He thrives on this perpetual debauch, but five years more of it will make me a fat, sour, ill-tempered lady, and fussy, worst of all, and assertive. All people who do feats on the flying trapeze and never think are as cocky as terriers after a rat, you know. <laughs> of all these things, and many others, I long to talk to you. Devotedly, Willa. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, you didn't sing it, but it did. <laughs> I think he gives her letters a lot of character, don't you think? I think so, too. Um, well, last but not least, as we work our way forward in the alphabet, Twyla Hansen. And I, I think we'll have Twyla read, and, and we'll finish up. I, now I have a couple of bookkeeping things to do, um, or whatever. And then if anybody has questions, I think probably people would be glad to answer questions, too. Twyla Hansen grew up near Lyons, Nebraska. I think you were born in Omaha, weren't you? 
Were you born? Was actually born she actually was born in Omaha. In a hospital. She was born in a hospital. Well, some people weren't born in hospitals. Okay. So she was born in Omaha, but she did grow up near Lyons, um, I think, on a farm. And you might hear more about that, actually. I don't know. She received several degrees from UNL. She lives in Lincoln and worked for a number of years as grounds manager, arboretum curator, slash arboretum curator at Nebraska Wesleyan University. One of her recent publications, is Dirt Songs, which kind of goes with that grounds manager thing. <laughs> uh, Dirt Songs, a Plains duet, co-authored with Linda, I don't know if it's Hasselstrom or Hazelstrom. 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 Linda Hazelstrom co-authored that book with, with Twyla. And that was done by Backwaters Press in 2011. In November of 2013, we were pleased that Twyla was named the Nebraska State Poet for five years from 2013 to 2018. So. Here's Twyla. Been sitting too long here. <laughs> wow, it's really tough to follow historic fiction and uh, historic, wonderful performance of some historic poetry and the words of our godmother, <laughs> writing godmother in Nebraska. That's awesome. Okay, so I, I gave a reading out in Kearney um, at a coffee shop uh, a while back, well, actually just a couple weeks ago, and um, the theme was birds and boys. And so I'm gonna read a few, just a few poems um, on that theme. And the boys are, most of them are my, my brothers. I have three older brothers. And as I like to say, I don't get mad at them anymore, I get even. <laughs> I write about them. This first one's called Shredded Wheat. At the kitchen table with a box of cold cereal, you read the news of the world from the makers of shredded wheat. Not bite size, not frosted or current flavored, but petite pillows wrapped in wax paper and, if you're lucky, whole. Is this the seed or the straw? Across the oilcloth, your older brother crushes his into a heaping haystack, same as he crushes crackers over soup and builds volcanoes on his supper plate of mashed potatoes, complete with gravy magma boozing. This is the brother who balances on the flatbed behind the baler, father at the wheel of the John Deere, lifting and stacking hay bales with the business end of a middle hook. Both of you pour on sugar and milk, whole and unpasteurized from a small herd, munching hay, corn, dust, each cow with its four amazing stomachs, Raw milk run through the separator, cream to the co-op, skim to the hogs. By the time you reach the bottom, the helping, no matter its size, is a soggy mess. Outdoors, the world is a lively, dirt-filled farmyard with clouds overhead, puffed and distant. If you are what you eat, this brother is pure meat and potatoes muscle. Father all egg and field corn and dairy, all systems slowly clogging. But this news you don't know right now. You just don't. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, this is called Green Apples and following the brothers or boys and birds. Green Apples. Because I want to be my older brother, I do what he tells me, with salt shaker, in hand-me-downs, climb up behind him, a ladder of limbs in the run-down orchard, perch at attention on the opposite side of the trunk, await orders. Apples tart inside and out the shade of early summer. The newly feathered pullets, meanwhile, beaks clipped, eyes blank, clucking at random for cracked corn and oyster shells in the dirt below, while mother gathers grocery money in the chicken house, 
where the dust of feathers and straw and droppings hangs visible in the air, a pungent haze, where a few hens huddle over hope in cubicles. When he says go, we lick and salt, that first mouthful of bolt through the taste buds, my brother and I cohorts in a conspiracy of silence. With a pocket knife, he stabs out wormholes. And because I want to be my older brother, I bite and spit, hoping this will do the trick. Unlock the door to the secret clubhouse, whether in the attic or on boards nailed to a branch. Notion to be blunted sooner rather than later. This brother betraying me when my stomach rebels, knuckles punching my arms silly. Mother saying, if I told you once, I told you a thousand times. There in a tangle of leaves, in a land of feast and famine, where pears and feeder calves and pines and manure, sweet clover and silage under the indifferent farmyard sun, where for a brief lifetime, my brother and I were one. <laughs> I remember telling my brother I was going to be as old as he was, was sometime. <laughs> he didn't like that. <laughs> he said, no, you're not. Yeah. Well, I was the only girl and little, little one, so, you know, anyway. Uh, this one's called Small. This is about, um, I lived in this really tiny uh, community. I uh, went to a one-room country school. And then we, we had to go to town to high school. So uh, this, this poem came out of that. It's called Small. When I was small, we made s'mores, but don't bother looking that one up. We were small fry in a small town, making small talk about small time lives into the small hours. I was often forced to sing small after my older brother made me feel very, very small. Older brothers are good at that. I was good at typing, pounding out 110 correct words of small pica per minute in class, the small roar of clackety-clack and carriage returns, my best friend and I in a small but undeclared race. We were insignificant and small potatoes, but were we small-minded? It was our teacher, petite and blonde Miss Buskirk, who also taught home ec and shorthand, who made us notice. Mr. Kaler, our science and math teacher, when they met in the hall, the small sparks between them. Her smile a pearly daz, his the perfect small boy grin. All that fall, the young new teachers in our small high school we watched it grow. At homecoming then, on a slow dance, his hand on the small of her back. Back then, we didn't know squat, but this, we just knew this would lead to something big. <laughs> we didn't know squat, really. <laughs> I just noticed Eloise in the Edwards. Hi, Eloise. Um, I would like to close my section with, um, to talk just a little bit about this book. Um, this is Dirt Songs, A Plains to Wet with my friend, good friend, he Linda Hazelstrom. And we put 50 of our poems together, 50-50. And it's not a collaboration in a sense that we went back and forth and decided what poems should be there. We just kind of trusted each other. She's a rancher writer from South Dakota, really pretty well known there, and um, famous. She's been on billboards in South Dakota as one of their well-known graduates of the University of South Dakota. That's pretty cool. They don't do that here, do they? Um, but anyway, um, <laughs> it, um, it turned out there were several poem pairs in here. We didn't realize it before we put the book together. And then when I had the book in my hand, we kind of were reading through. You know how you do, you read all the way through. And, uh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. So we kind of had some poem pairs. And that's what, I'd like to read a poem of Linda's. 
that kind of pairs with a poem of mine. So the first one is Linda um, Hazelstrom. That's Swedish, by the way, so it's pronounced Hazelstrom. Um, it's called Hawk in My Hand. A hawk hangs from the wind over the road ditch. Looking up, I feel my own heart pulse in my chest in time with a hawk's heartbeat in my wrist. The hawk, balanced on air, knows the heartbeat of the mole. The mole's veins pulse with blood made of plants. The hawk tastes the mole's heartbeat, stoops and eats and kills and eats. The plant's blood, the mole's blood, throbs in the hawk's heart. The plant, the mole, the hawk, and the wind drum in my wrist. I hold a hawk in my hand. The hawk holds me. That's Linda Hazelstrom. And um, by the way, before we quit um, or end, I just want to thank you all for coming. This is an uh, awesome audience. They're out in the hallway. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Hallway room only. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Okay, feeding the hawk. I do this on a warm afternoon, June, from a chaise on the deck, my hand holding a glass, wine red, and overhead a splay of tail to match, above the back tree line, above the field beyond. The hawk, the hawk soars, ignores the jays and chatter. I am feeding the hawk one small rodent or mammal at a dive, creatures that roam my land in search of worm or grub or root. Below the tangle of branch and limb and trunk, leetle, leaf and needle and blade, flower and pollen and sap, where fe feathers and fur and small claws small enough attempt to disappear when wings cast their shadow, ripple through heat, rising, tilt, outstretched, still. It's, it's as if this slow moment is a shower of manna, a sign. On command, I take, eat, drink, in ethereal communion with the gods. Thank you.